Happy New Year and welcome to the True Talk Cafe podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited that you're here. Our podcast will tackle a myriad of topics ranging from relationships to personal development and everything in between. Today's show is called Quiet Quitting is Speaking Volumes. We'll discuss the impact this current trend is having on organizations and how to combat it. But before we dive in, let me introduce you to the pod crew. My name is Renee Stewart, and I'm joined by my co-host, Anna Garcia. Hi, Anna. Hey, everyone. Carla Decor. Hey, Carla. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. And Lolly Ramirez Bennett. Hi, Lolly. Hello, everyone. Hey, ladies. Collectively, we span four generations. Can you believe that? We've all experienced ups and downs in our personal lives and professional careers that have qualified us to share our unique perspectives with you, and we're excited to do so. Before we get into today's content, I wanted to let you know where you can find us on social media. On Instagram and Facebook, you can use at True Talk Cafe, and on Twitter, you can use at True Talk Cafe One. Don't forget to like us, rate us, and leave a review. We value your feedback. We want to ensure that we are providing content that resonates with you. So please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you listen to your podcast. We are so excited about today's show. So you will want to stay tuned to hear what our guests are going to share about how to identify and deal with quiet quitters. Also stick around to find out how you can join us for our live show. So now let's get started. So what is quiet quitting and where did this concept originate? While much has been written about the great resignation, a new term emerged during 2020 to describe an increasingly common alternative to resigning, which is known as quiet quitting. Driven by many of the same underlying factors as actual resignations, quiet quitting refers to opting out of tasks beyond one's assigned duties and are becoming less psychologically invested in work. Quiet quitters continue to fulfill their primary responsibilities, but they're less willing to engage in activities known as citizenship behaviors. No more staying late, showing up early, or attending non-mandatory meetings, therefore not impacting the current culture. According to the Los Angeles Times, the first known use of quiet quitting was by Brian Creeley, a Nashville-based corporate recruiter turned career coach, who invoked it in a March 4, 2022 video posted on TikTok and YouTube. However, it is said to have originated years earlier in 2009 Remarks from an economist named Mark Bolger. Still others trace the concept, though not the term, to China where a similar workplace phenomenon called lying flat appears to have originated about a year earlier. Who knew this was a thing 15 years ago? As our conversations continue, we'll delve deeper into this trend and much more. To add to this discussion, we've invited two experts that are very familiar with this trend that will share their expertise and experience with us. Let me introduce Melanie Brown, who is a VP of Data Analytics at Capgemini, and Ken Smith, who has some background with military as well as mechanical engineering and has, has his master's degree in organizational psychology from Columbia University. Both of these guests will help us understand a little bit more and shed some light on this topic. All right, first question. In the early 2020s, driven largely by social media, quiet quitting emerged as a much publicized trend to the United States and elsewhere. However, some observers have questioned how come it actually is and whether it's even a phenomenon. Ken, what are your thoughts about quiet quitting being a new phenomenon or not? What type of impact has it had on managers? And in your opinion, do you think it's a real thing? Thanks, Renee. So no, I don't think it's a, it's a new thing. It may be a new term or a, a new buzzword for something, but there's nothing new about what's going on. We've been talking about engagement for years, and that's been the the, the previous big buzzword around this: are people are engaged, are they actively engaged, are they engaged, are they disengaged, or are they actively disengaged? I think all this looks at is just just another way of saying these are people that are either disengaged or actively disengaged in the workplace. Okay. Melanie, would you like to add any comments? Thanks, Renee. I completely agree with Ken that the terminology has changed, perhaps because it's a little bit more on steroids due to COVID. It's more observable because there's more, more masses in terms of 
a group. The groups are now doing quiet quitting almost together, and there's a lot of platforms out there that they're those that are engaged in quiet quitting are stating, no, I'm not working right now, or I'm going to leave right now. But the actual term about engagement is more crucial, in my opinion, of just saying, how do we draw workers in and how do we keep them, produce a thriving environment for that work in and make work meaningful and purposeful. And Renee, to follow up and answer your question, what, what impact is it having on, on managers? It's having the same impact that it, that it always does. Leaders and, and managers have the responsibility for aligning people to a vision, for engaging people, for inspiring people. Uh, and it's always been a leader's responsibility, and some do it better than others. I think what it's showing now is it's showing the leaders that aren't doing this, it's highlighting it. It's causing them to be spotlighted a little bit, and it's causing them to feel the effects of it a little bit more. But it's always been their responsibility. It's just now... People are just calling them out for when they're not accomplishing that responsibility. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, sorry about that, Renee, because I was thinking that that's a really good point, but it's on, there's two ends of the spectrum. So when we're talking about a leader's responsibility, absolutely to provide that vision and put that in, provide that work environment. But equally is that there was also unrealistic expectation from perhaps more traditional workers expecting everybody to do more, stay late, do these things, which was not necessarily reasonable and caused the, the work-life balance terminology came out of that. And so I think we're just trying to find where's that happy place in moving from one side to the next. Yeah, thank you for those comments. And just kind of round this, up, round this question out, I'm finding that generationally, it's a little bit different as well. I'm finding that some of the younger generations are, you know, they're really taking this thing, <laughs> you know, they're really taking it serious. Some of maybe like your more mature workers, you're always going to have what I call bottom feeders that are pretty much quite quitting. But for the most part, your middle workers or your high potentials, they typically hold themselves accountable, you know, and they kind of have their own work ethic. So what do you think about that? Renee, I think that's a, a really good point is that when we, there's an old term out there that only, and it was accepted that only 20% of the people who actually do the work. Well, we have to really ask ourselves, why was that okay? Why was the workplace saying 80% really don't come in and do the work, but we'll count on and burn out 20% of the workforce? And that, yeah, we have to really think about that. So I think that there's an expectation of holding yourself accountable. What is that? What is the career path? What does somebody want to do? But not being expected to work those 12, 15, 16, even sometimes 17 plus hours a day to just be in the game. And I think that there's, we're actually just finding equilibrium and recalibrating those expectations. And some of those leaders that thought you need to work excessive hours to demonstrate that you're committed to the the company, those days are, are gone. And we're just seeing that amplified now to find that work-life balance. Yeah, I think the other thing you want to talk generations that you, you really have to pay attention to is that, you know, the workforce that's coming in that's, you know, 18 to, to 24 right now, they're a little bit frustrated. They don't quite see like, what's the purpose? They don't have a lot of hope right now. And that's unfortunate. And, and that's one of the things that's really going in is there's like, well, well, why? What's in it for me? They're very pessimistic about the world, what's going on with the world, where it's going. Is there even going to be anything for them? So they have a lot of just general pessimism that you can't ignore. It's not to make that an excuse, but you just have to understand what's going on in their mindset right now. And, and, that's, and that's impacting their performance at work. Thank you for that. And I think at first, well, I if I may, I think one of the things that I've seen is that with the pandemic, we were basically doing our best to survive and manage through that crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think that we saw people really stop working through performance management. It's not something that they were dealing with because it was just managing through what we had to deal with. And now we're getting back into that mindset. I do believe it is something that's very critical as we move forward because, you know, we've had as a economy continues to get worse. You know, we see more surpluses, we see, et cetera. So the people that are there really need to at least pull their hundred percent. 
in most cases, you're looking at those that are not pulling even 50% because again, they kind of got disengaged, but it's time for us to come back in and, and reel those people in as, as leaders of a business to ensure that we're getting what we need to and that we're being fair to everybody around us. Because for those people that do work, you shouldn't have somebody only giving you 50% while you have other, someone else giving you 150%. It's just not right. Mm-hmm. I, I want to add, Melanie, earlier you mentioned that, you know, it, it's also leadership. It's not just, you know, the employees. It goes back to management. And I think that's a very valid point. I have seen, I have actually experienced first, you know, on a first case where some of us are doing more, are not quite quitting and are still overshadowed by those who are doing the bare minimum. Mm-hmm. Leadership sometimes has some you know, biases that they might not be, be aware of. So when we talk about the management responsibility, do you think we can discuss that a little bit further? I don't think it's just first-line management. I think it goes well above that. And what type of responsibility should HR and all of the powers to be be bringing down so that leadership does know how to really do that observation and, you know, manage the employees well, but also not, you know, say, well, you know, if she's going to do 100% and this one's going to do 150%, then we're okay. Versus why can't, or this one's going to do 20% and this one's got 180%, let her keep working. Like, why not start managing that, right? This always was a great question for me. Like, where yeah. is there an actual balance? I think an interesting thing point, and you know, you mentioned how they give it 100%, 80%, 50%. I, I like to draw a very, very defined line, a very clear line. Are they meeting the expectations? Are they meeting the expectations and the requirements of their job? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing, yes or no? Now, a lot of times what we're lumping into and calling quite quitting is people who aren't going above and beyond. Well, I've also heard the term steady stayers. You know, if they are doing what they're supposed to do, if they're meeting their expectations, if they're doing their job, well, we used to call those pillars. And you want an organization full of pillars. Now, if an individual is not meeting their expectations, not meeting the requirements of their job, well, that's called poor performance. That's underperforming. And there is a very you know, important leadership skill in bringing somebody along who is underperforming. But I think it's very, very unfair if we lump in these things that says, well, if you're just doing the, your job and only your job, then there's something wrong with you. And I think that's very unfair to people. That's, I think, putting a negative connotation on somebody who shows up, who's on time, who does their responsibilities, who does it well. Okay, those are awesome. Do you want people to give more? Absolutely you do. You, you want people that are, are your, your high performers that want to go out there and want to conquer the world and give a whole lot more? Well, of course you do. But it's called a minimum standard for a reason. It's a minimal acceptable standard. And, and I think that's a huge differentiation. And if we don't identify the difference, you say, are you talking about low performance? That's one set of skill sets that a leader has to have and a manager has to have. And that's when they do need some of the support from the HR and, and we need performance improvement plans. And that should be something done to actually truly raise performance, not an administrative task you do before you want to fire somebody. If we truly care about people, that's the type of things that leaders do need some support with from their human resources and the, from their fellow leaders as well to, to learn some of those things. But I really like the idea of thinking about them as steady stayers. There are pillars and there are strength of our organization. And I hope that we can differentiate between those two and not just lump, you know, minimal effort, but still doing their job with not doing their job. Yeah, that's I think a, good, that's where a lot of it fails. Is that mm-hmm. There's a lot of that happening and you hear it all the time. And I think that's why there's more and more people willing to quite quit because it's there's no really minimal qualifications or they're not well defined or they're set differently for each individual, et cetera. You know, so I think that training needs to be part of that. And then managers have the ability to create a culture that engages in employees to want to do their work. You know, they have that ability versus allowing it to just sit and okay, well it's working for the numbers, you know? Yeah. How do you retain yeah, in a similar forum like this, we had a really fantastic discussion about requirements and expectations. And there, there was a large group in the, that thought that there's a difference between the requirements of your job and the expectations of the leader. 
And to me, in a good organization and an effective leader, there, there is no difference. The requirements yeah. and the expectations are the same. And the, the critical aspect of any expectations is they have to be shared expectations and they have to be agreed upon expectations. That's the very basis of holding anybody accountable is, is those first two steps. Clearly identifying the expectations and gaining commitment on the expectations because you can't hold somebody accountable if those first two steps haven't happened. And if we as leaders are doing what we're supposed to do and clearly setting those expectations, well, then the problems will go away. Now, a lot of times what we need to do as a leader is we need to raise our expectations and we need to gain commitment for those expectations. It, and I'll give you an example. I was an engineering manager for an oil and gas company, and we had equipment that was working 24 seven offshore. And the expectation was that we had one engineer that was on call all the time. And we rotated who that was. The expectation was very clear. When it's your week to be on call, you're available 24 hours a day. You don't go on vacation. You don't go to a place where you don't have any cell coverage. You don't go out and, 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 and are drinking and where you're unable to drive or anything like that. Those expectations were set and, and managed. And they got paid accordingly. They got paid really good salaries because we knew, hey, you're going to be doing extra. It was clear. It was managed. It was expectations. We had briefings at the end of the time. How did that go for you? So that expectation was set. If, if it's just assumed that that's what they're going to do and they're not compensated for it in some way, well, then that's unrealistic and unfair for the employee as well. We knew we paid people more than the average rate because the expectation of extra time was there. And the other thing that was, was really important is that, you know, as a leader, we, we always have a tendency to know when somebody's not quite, you know, they're, they're not getting something done. And I used to always say, hey, look, if you got everything you need done and you've got nothing else to do, well, go do it someplace else. If you don't need to be here right now. You've got your stuff done. I know later I'm going to be asking more of you. So we're, we're, we employers tend to be very upset when they don't get more when they ask for it. But yet, are they counting the times that says, well, there's nothing going on, then go take off. And are they, they allowing people those times as well? And I think that managers oftentimes have a very jaded view and they, they look at one really, really closely and they don't look in the mirror at the other one. And that's unfortunate that they really should and give people credit for maybe time is how we're compensating for people. If you work an extra four hours here, well, then you should get four hours of comp time later. And I think those are skills that, that leaders have at their disposal. And if they're not using them very well, well, shame on them. Carla, you want to weigh in? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm finding is that a lot of managers are not aware of quite quick. So it seems that it's not problematic at first, right? Because these people are still there. They're still working. They're still performing. But I think what is happening a lot of times is that they're just refusing to go beyond the call of duty. They're sticking to to their duties only when a lot of times, especially other generations may be used to people always put in the extra effort and maybe helping out when, you know, there are vacant vacancy within the company. And that is no longer happening for those people that are quite quitting in essence. Right. So Melanie, let me start with you. Do you think that the quite quitting trend suggests that employee employers are increasingly feeling that this exchange has become unbalanced perhaps? I know you briefly mentioned the work-life balance. So perhaps that is something that is happening. What are your thoughts, Melanie? Yeah, I think you make a great point that there's an unconscious bias, perhaps just how perhaps how leaders had their experience as they were growing through their career of what their expectations were. And then it has changed, but there's not this natural tendency to adjust to today's environment. And what we experienced during COVID really d demonstrated that the expectation around finding the lines of work and life, just life in general, were becoming so blurred that people began to just shut down. And it was not a, a generational aspect. And also because of the fact that people were moving in and creating home offices in their kitchens and, and all of a sudden the lines were just blurred. So people just said, I need boundaries. Well, that's okay. It's okay to have boundaries. And it is okay to say, I work this these hours. I respect that. And that's perfectly fine if the work is getting done. But if they're the going above and beyond, which is also coined around quiet quitting, if there is 
it's changed now. So now there's the boundaries and then say on the sidelines that somebody's saying that person's not going above and beyond. But did we ever ask? Did we ever ask and say, okay, these are the hours you want to work. You, I respect you have boundaries. And, but today, can you, can you do X for me today? Can you stay an extra two hours online? Whatever it is, I have found by asking, there's really stepping up. But if you don't ask, then there's a, it seems that there's an observable effort that they're starting to move from being engaged to disengaged. So it's no longer just automatic. And we have to make sure that we're separating between those that are moving toward being disengaged or worse, a saboteur is actively disengaged, or if they are just moving and keeping their boundaries, but will step up if needed. They just need to be asked. So I think that those are some of the aspects that we're, we're seeing trending. Yeah. And Carla, I think that w what I actually love going on in the workplace right now is that employees are, are becoming a little bit more empowered and they're holding employers accountable for what they should have been doing all along. And I think that that's a fantastic thing. And if if you're going to ask more for somebody, then I always kind of ask the question, well, are you are you compensating them for that in some way? Are you rewarding them for that in some way? Or do you just have this expectation that they're going to give everything and you don't have to give anything back as an employer? And, and I think that's the wrong answer. I, I think that if you're going to ask for more, then you should give more. And and sometimes you, we say that, you know, if you, if you don't want to pay anything extra, don't ask for anything special. And we, we have that expectation if we're buying something, like if we want the, 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 the power seats in our car, we expect that we're going to pay for them a little more. But yet somehow employers think that if, you know, we want them to, to, to build the power seats for us, but we're just going to only pay for standard seats, that that's, that's okay. And, and I don't think that is okay. So I, I like the fact that, that people are speaking out now and that they are saying, wait, boundaries are a good thing. We should have boundaries. We should be able to turn off our phone in the evening and not have to worry about answering emails, you know, past hours and, and these things. I think those are great things again. And I, and I agree with what you're saying. It kind of really goes back to those shared expectations. If Can, you're in a 24 hour seven job, then that's the expectation and they know it. Real quick, when you, when you were talking about compensation, you know, sometimes I would like to say we're not all always interested in the monetary compensation. There's other ways. To your point earlier, when you said you don't have nothing to do here, go do it somewhere else. Some people would appreciate flexibility within their daytime or, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to schedule a doctor's appointment. So what are some creative and this is not, you know, we're going a little bit off, you know, what we had discussed prior. But what are some creative ways that we can you know, provide some type of compensation to employees that may not be just interested in the monetary portion. I personally, when my kids were young, I wanted to be time with my, my children, you know, games and all the such. So, Melanie, feel free to weigh in as well. Just, you know, a little bit of information of what you've heard would be an equally am equal amount of compensation. Oh, absolutely. It's generally that's not residing around money. It is around the flexibility. It is around, can I just take time off or just feel comfortable, say, put it on my calendar, put it on your manager's calendar, whatever that is, is just say, I'm out and just let us know what's doing that. We're, I work for Capgemini, we're a very large consulting firm, we are global. So we work across multiple time zones and I may have on one call, somebody that's in the, the West Coast that it's four in the morning for them because the workday is starting on the East Coast. So do they work still to the end of the day? Well, that would not make sense. But because I know that could be more challenging, just find more work-life balance, find that you have the flexibility and not be concerned that if I take off for a doctor's appointment, I'm going to be managed or monitored that I took two hours off. Just take the time you need, your work's getting done, or you make it up in another way, but have that trust, building that trust that hours are no longer rigid like they were going into the, the office, if you will. You have to show up at you know seven in the morning and you work till five or something. Those days are gone. And I think that's a good thing because it gives the, for anybody that has, is taking care of parents or children or they, or just, it doesn't even have to be measured around that, that they just have things to do, but it doesn't, can't be just done at, at the 
in the evening. So we're trying to balance that. And what we find is then we do see an uptick around engagement. We're not seeing that quiet quitting. But what concerns me is when I'm seeing those high performers and then all of a sudden they're starting to shut down, that's when I get more concerned of like, what change? Is the work no longer interesting? And then that is incumbent on leaders to say, what is what is your career path? Have those conversations. What are you interested in? This is not the only option, particularly in a very large organization, a global organization like Capgemini. And, and I like to say that leadership is a one-on-one -on -one sport. And what I mean for that is that, that it's not that teamwork isn't important. But as a leader, you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with every single person you lead. And you have to treat that as an individual one-on-one -on -one relationship. So I always say, well, what, what, what's the most, the best way to do this? Well, it depends. What does that person value? And if you know the people on your team well, and you know what they value, and you know that a hey, time with their kids are being able to go to lunch or go to this, this, this you know, school event that they have going on at odd times, you know, if that's what's the most valuable to you, then that's what I, I leverage in a good way, not manipulate. I leverage in a good way of understanding what does that person value and how do I provide what that person values the most? Does that person value recognition? Do they value promotion? Do they value training? Do they value money? Do they value time? You know, everybody's got different levers that they value more than anybody else. And a leader's responsibility is to know that person, know what they value, and to the best extent that they're possible to use those to to gain motivation and to, to get better performance out of them. So that's the creative ways. The leader is only limited by their own creativity. I, I have one of my engineers, he loved Twix bars. That was his jam. And so every once in a while, when, you know, he was doing something pretty good, you know, I kept a, a stash of him in my desk and I just throw one up over on him. And he was just like, he knew that, okay, Ken sees what I'm doing. And all right, this is pretty cool. And you see a big old smile on his face and boy, they didn't cost me very much, but, but, you know, I understood what, what each person valued and that's what leaders have to do. And that's to answer your question. Those are the creative things that they can do, whatever it takes. I remember is. coming to many a Starbucks cards at my desk by, can you come yes. see me? I'm like, oh, what do you need? I, I do recall. Well, thank you. I just wanted to ask that because I just, in case there's any managers out there listening to us, I think it's good to take note that there's other ways. Think outside the box and let's all get to the end, you know, goal together here. And I think that Ken said something important around just be observant. I mean, there's watch be just watch how behaviors are changing when we're hearing about the quiet quitting. That's just it. It's silent. You're not going to know. And it's just like I'm I'm going to check out. I'll all of a sudden they're not on calls and they're because they're looking for another job or they're deciding this isn't important. But why do they think that is if they're inviting? So we really have to think about also time time is equal for all of us there we all have 24 hours in a day no more no less so how are we valuing time because you don't get that back so a lot of folks will say why do i have to be at this meeting and if you don't have something that is active for them to participate in to provide some input then why are they there and then you'll start seeing checking out there in those environments as well so make sure that if you're having meetings, every participant has a reason and purpose to be in that meeting. Otherwise, you'll see them, people checking out and feeling their day is wasted. And really, that's what I'm seeing is on, around the quiet quitting. What if, what contribution am I making? How am, How is my work adding value back into the organization? If they can't find that, then we're missing a lot of great conversations that can help them on their career path as well. Thank you for that. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So Lally, Melanie, I, yes, ahead. absolutely. I was going to follow up on that question or that, or that comment that Melanie made regarding those people. I think it has a lot to do with mutual respect between the manager absolutely. and the employee. And that if you take, if you identify the fact that you're being conscientious about their time, they start to appreciate that and, and give it back to you as well. So, MPR actually asked his listeners a couple of questions about quiet quitting back in September of 2022. One was an administrative assistant identified as Christy G, who said, in part, I do not interact with anything from work before 7 or after 4.30, which is the time my office is open. I work in a corporate setting, so my tasks are not life or death. 
if someone asks for something like maybe a file scanned or something like that at the end of the day, it can wait till the next day. So the question that, that, that we wanted to ask you was, as a manager, how can you identify an employee like Christy and get her reengaged? Now, I have to throw in that, in my opinion, I personally think that that goes back to what Ken said earlier about the expectations. If something like that is important, then we need to make sure that they know that it's important. So go ahead and get it taken care of today and not. But if we don't tell them that that's something they should be doing, that's my personal feedback. Any thoughts on that, Melanie or Ken? Well, I think that there's two things here is one is saying, here's my my work day. These are my tasks. And there, it's very valid to say that, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world if I don't get it done today. That is true. And that could be for the most part. However, if going back to the expectation piece, scanning a file or taking care of a given task, or perhaps that manager needs something that is going to be for an important meeting in the next morning, and they have to have it before for preparation, just have that conversation. I, I think that keeping the, the work-life balance the, and having boundaries is perfectly fine, and we should have those. But if there is something important, it's, it's a conversation, hey, do you mind taking care of this for me today? And then that'll come back to your point, Molly, about respect. If you have mutual respect and it's not uh, overused, then it's, it's certainly people will step up, I find, and there's not any issue there. Very good. Maybe go a little bit deeper on this, this one here. An individual like this that, that has tasks that may be a little bit you know, more routine, I, I think that one of the things you're missing is this fundamental element of what people really thrive in. And people thrive in an element where they have autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And in instances like this, there may not be a lot of autonomy. And, and that's unfortunate. If you're not giving people the autonomy to figure out well, how those things get done, well, they get a little frustrated by that. If there's no opportunity for mastery, then what are they striving for? It's like why people play instruments in the union. They want mastery. They don't get paid for it. They just they want to get good at something. And, and the purpose is understanding well, what's the bigger picture here? Why are we really doing this? What does it matter? And purpose is becoming more and more and more important to people. And they're seeing that in their job selections and in the companies they want to work for and how they're spending their money. You know, if they don't feel like what they're doing has any purpose, then it's hard to really get fired up and excited about it. So, so in this instance, I would be looking at those three things and saying, okay, does this employee have autonomy, mastery, and purpose in what they're doing? That's kind of where I would start with this particular one and less of, about, you know, the surface challenge. I love that. Well, I think that's just, very good advice. Yeah. And I, I would just say, though, that it, in this case, if we, we have to understand is that if the um, if it's the ask at the end of the day to do something extra, I it I don't think if we we say that it's a it whether they're master or not it's just putting those boundaries. If we're looking at their their board or they don't want to do anything extra, then absolutely I, I see that applying because at the end of the day it is about having meaning and purpose each and every day, knowing that we're adding value back to what we're doing. Yeah, and on a practical purpose, the the way I like and encourage leaders to set about when something can be done. Instead of telling somebody when you need something to be done, ask them when they can have it done and then negotiate after you've got their answer. So if you were to instead of saying, Christy, I need you to scan this tonight, say, Christy, when can you have the scan? And if she says, well, tomorrow, then you can follow up with a question. Well, what would it take to get it done tonight? So asking instead of telling and then having a discussion afterwards, I find is much more effective and you end up getting what you want or you learn information that's of value to you that you can make decisions because the thing she's working on may be more important and maybe you, you're you okay with that. So I think as a leader, asking versus telling is a critical skill that, that you can learn really easily and apply it regularly and, and get a lot better results. Excellent, excellent advice. So the second example that we had was a department manager identified as Sarah who told NPR that her priorities and values have changed significantly since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Her comments were, I now leave my office at the end of the day, not thinking about what I need to work on when I get home at night. I set boundaries for checking my emails and reaching out to coworkers during non-office hours. Most importantly, I do not feel any bit of anxiety when it comes to requesting time off, taking personal days, or especially taking sick time. 
what approach would you take to get this manager reengaged? I, I, I got to tell you, I don't know if, if that reality is, is that if it's time off that they should be taking, I think they should be taking it, right? It's personal days and things of that nature. But again, it's really, if, if there's more to be done after hours, what would you do? I think probably a lot of what you just told us, right? Setting those expectations, communicating, asking, but any other thoughts on that? Well, I think we have to, it, it's really broad, first and foremost, is just say if it's okay to set boundaries. And and that that is part of providing an, a receptive and enjoyable work environment, is that I know I can be okay with going in, getting what I need to get done, and not feel that anxiety that I'm not on 24-7, that there will be some negative impact on my career for that. That's okay. But if the job, going back to the expectation, is if there's certain elements of the job and things are, are there, I would just ask, you know, is it all this extra work need to be done because you don't have enough staffing? Is it, is it because that's just, are you intentionally, the hours are required all the time? Or it is, is it just certain times? So I'd have some questions around that scenario of just what, before answering it fully, but I would just say that boundaries are, okay, we should have them. We should be able to walk away and and disconnect and, and decompress. We're better for it. We're energized for that. And then yeah. we are better contributors through that because now our minds are, are clear and health inward. We have a balance between mind, body, and spirit. If we do that, then we're, we're connected and we're able to contribute at a higher order. But if we're, if this is continuous, then I absolutely would re-examine the, do we have enough staffing to our, the jobs? Is it the manager's responsibility? Is it, what is being asked? And then going back to Ken's point of having that, that purpose and having that elements of expectations established. Yeah. And, and if, if, if Sarah in this story is, is really doing a great job and getting all the things done that she's supposed to do and her team is performing and, you know, her turnover rate is low, I say good on her. I say great. I, I'm proud of, of people that, that take this time and attitude and this kind of approach. And, and I agree with Melanie. There's, there's value in needing to, to turn that off and to, to be fully present when you're there. Now, again, if she's not fully present when she's there, if she's not performing the things that she needs to do, that's, again, a different problem. But the fact that she doesn't want to work when she leaves work, not, not a problem. In my not opinion, problem. that's not a problem. <laughs> That's that's just not quite good. quitting. <laughs> yeah. good for that's her. not quitting. That's man. That's good management. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. that's being yeah, that's managing your time and your energies, and that's setting good priorities, and you know that's that's giving a hundred percent, and if that allows her to give a hundred percent when she's there, and to really be there for her team, and be there for her people, and to do the things she's supposed to do. Well, good. Her team's better off for it then. Definitely agree with you on that one. That, that's, I think that it's not that you should be working around the clock, right? It should, you should be working hard during the time that you should be working. And again, those expectations need to be set. And I think Anna said it well, is that it's what you ask of one person should be the same thing that you ask of others, mm-hmm. right? So it's not just you're picking on Anna to be available all the time because she's used to doing that. It should be across the board. So thank you so much for that. Renee, I'm going to throw it back to you. Yeah, let's take a look at some statistics here and you can share your thoughts and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. According to Gallup survey of workers age 18 and older, taken in June of 22, quiet quitters make up at least 50% of the U.S. workforce, probably more. The percentage is particularly high among workers under the age of 35. And I think we kind of talked about the, gen- the generations before. Based on a series of questions related to worker engagement, defined as the involvement and enthusiasm of employees in the work and in their work and workplace, Gallup arrived on the following conclusions. First, only 32% of workers came across as engaged while another 18% were disengaged, meaning that they made no secret of their job satisfaction. The other point was the remaining 50% could be classified as quiet quitters, people who are not especially engaged in the work, but didn't broadcast the fact. If those numbers are accurate, 
than a stunning 68% of American job holders are unhappy with their work to one degree or another. Would you agree with those statistics, give or take? Well, I, I think there's some truth there. When we're looking at the expectation, if you do some other, combine it with some other studies that say, what is it you want for your career path? A lot of those studies also indicate, and I don't have them before me, but a lot of them also indicate that they're not doing the job that they want to do. They took the job because they needed to. So there's just a natural progression that they wouldn't be have high satisfaction. So it would be interesting more to break that down is, are they doing the job that they wanted to do? And if you're if your organization can help open up new pathways for success and not have that unconscious bias or, or be unobservable, then you can begin to put them in a path that will help put them on a trajectory that's more interesting. And it may not even be aligned with their current skill set. So are we willing to upskill? Are we le- willing to put them in new training because they're a valued employee? And again, it comes back to you are valued. You matter. You make a difference in this job and we want you to, to be satisfied. So we would want to to re-examine that just a little bit, but it is, the numbers are astonishing and it, it definitely means that we, we need to be thinking about it more deeply and addressing the concerns, certainly of those workers. Yeah, and the, the Gallup engagement statistics are always fascinating to read. I look at them every year when they come. Yeah. And you're right, the, from those numbers, 32% are actually what they consider engaged and everybody else is, is disengaged. And, and that is, uh, uh, again, there's no one cause of that. What I, I like to think of when you think about an individual, if they're engaged, they, they want to be a valued member on a winning team with a noble mission. And, and a lot of times one of those three elements is missing. Do they feel like they're a valued member? That's the easiest thing that we as leaders have that we can control, making people feel valued no matter what job that they're doing. You know, the winning team, you know, if, if you're – your company is performing poorly, if you're not getting good results, and those are frustrating for, for anybody. And a lot of times we'll be like, well, why do I want to put in a bunch of effort if all we're doing is, you know, we keep losing you know, market share or whatever they're looking at. And then that, that noble purpose, that noble mission, kind of goes back to that purpose again. Same thing as the, the before, uh, you know, is what we do matter. And a lot of that, a leader does have an ability to influence because you can say, well, what do we do here? And you say, well, we manufacture things. I was like, well, no. What we do here is we fuel the world. We fuel people's hopes and dreams. We allow people to go visit their families. We allow people to go to go see the world and do things that they want to do. Are we really helping people understand the big picture and what they're doing and why it matters and why it's important? And, and we as leaders have the ability to influence those. We can't make those happen. But we as leaders have the ability to influence those and to really try to, to make people feel that way. And I, I think sometimes leaders just don't put enough energy or effort into that. And that's that's unfortunate. And that's a disservice to their team. Yeah, and Ken, you make a great point about success. People are attracted to success. People are attracted to high energy. People like to know that you're moving the needle forward. Call it being you want to be part of the cool kid table. So how do we you get there, but if you're not part of that and you see other teams doing that, again, you'll start seeing that quiet quitting if they're not being able, if all their their team does is definitely, they're not acknowledged, they're not recognized, they're not moving the needle, they're, they don't feel like that team is really, has the value back to the organization or their contributions of that team matter, then that also contributes to that quiet yeah. quitting element and dissatisfaction. And then you have to really evaluate, okay, is it a skill will or a resource deficit? Why are we not performing well? I mm-hmm. believe that, you know, all human performance issues comes to a skill will or a resource deficit. Which of those is missing? Are we missing the skills? Do we not know how to do something? Okay, how do we do that? Do we need to bring other people in that have the skills? Do we need to train the skills? How do we acquire those? If it's a resource deficit, well, what things are we missing? Do we have the ability to get those or is it just not capable? And if it's a will deficit, you know, are they, is they, they don't believe in what we're doing. They don't, they don't care. They don't see it as the same priority we are. Well, then you have to decide, can you inspire that in people? Or do you need to, you know, let them find a different place that does inspire them a little bit more and bring people on board that, that are inspired by what you do. So they're, they're all hard choices and they're not easy solutions. 
But if we're not looking for them, if we're not actively trying to figure out what's going on, if we're not doing some diagnosis and trying new things and experimenting and seeing what sticks, then again, we have nobody to blame but ourselves. And, and oftentimes it is just poor leadership that needs to learn better skills. Yeah. And I think it goes back to what you said that, you know, it's about a, having autonomy, mastery and purpose. And a lot of times I think a lot of people in leadership positions don't recognize that it is their job to also find help employees find that purpose. Right. So thank you. Thank you both for for that. So in summary, quite quitting may or may not be a bona fide trend or recent phenomenon, as we know, but it is called attention to what appears to be a f fairly widespread dissatisfaction among American workers that employers might need to address. And, and I think you both provided a lot of great solutions. And it's, I think it's important for our listeners to also understand that it doesn't always have to be monetarily. So thank you for, for asking those questions, Anna, and for for Melanie and Ken to really provide some other alternatives. So thank you both for being here today. Anna? Yeah, so once again, guys, thank you for the conversation, your insights and thoughts, Melanie and Ken, and to all of our listeners for joining the pod crew today. While its disruption to organizational functioning may be less visible than that of the Great Resignation, quite quitting can be, in fact, more damaging. To address this challenge, leaders must focus on motivating employees to fulfill their core tasks listen to workers and address their unique needs and create cultures that invite workers to craft their own approaches to citizenship. With that said, we hope you learned something new and or came away with a different perspective on this topic. You can follow our guest, Melanie Brown, on LinkedIn as Melanie, Melanie Brown. Ken Smith is also available and we'll share all of that information at the end of our podcast. So as promised, here's how to join a future show as an audience member. We hope you're excited as we are, but go to our True Talk Cafe Facebook page and send us a request to attend season two, episode two, as an audience member. Be sure to use the hashtag TTCS2EP2, where we will respond to requests with our podcast website link, where you'll need to enter your preferred email address for us to send the audience link for attendance. We'll also send all audience members a reminder the day before the show recording. It's going to be so much fun to have you join us live. As always, we welcome your feedback, so please let us know your thoughts about today's show. Leave a comment or, re or review. We will respond to all comments, but please be nice. We'd love to hear your thoughts about today's topic. Do not forget to like and rate the episode, and we appreciate you tuning in, and we hope you join the TTC Crew Facebook page. Again, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook using at True Talk Cafe and use the hashtag TTC Talks or True Talk Tuesdays to showcase any of your favorite parts of the episodes. Recommendations for discussion topics are always welcome. We want to ensure we are providing content that has a value to you. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thanks for listening and we hope you join us on our next podcast episode. It's sure to be an engaging conversation. Talk soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.